Heute beginnen wir mit Today we start with the first video of our Vespa model series and talk about the Vespa Wideframe. The Vespa Wideframe models are the very early Vespas and there are two problems. First, I never had the money to buy one and secondly, I only know how to dismantle original parts. That's why we need an expert and we're lucky that we found a very special one. We here at SIP are very fortunate to have a Vespa Classic scooter expert right here in-house. This is Oliver Schmuck and I would like to ask him to briefly introduce himself. Hello, I'm Oliver Schmuck. I've been collecting Vespas for 20 years and it's my great passion. I somehow fell in love with these things and tried to collect as many existing models as possible. I always try to track down the different parts and where the differences between the individual models actually lie. And since 14 years, I have also turned my hobby into a job and work here at ZIP. Piaggio didn't originally build two wheelers at all. It actually built airplanes and helicopters, I think rail vehicles too. How exactly did they get to set up such a two wheeler? Well, after the war, Dr. Piaggio had the idea of quickly mobilizing the population again. And so he turned to his designer, Dascanio, and told him to develop a vehicle for him that was as simple as possible and that the whole population could drive. Small fun fact. Dascanio was a helicopter designer and he really enjoyed doing that. But he didn't really want to build two-wheelers. To this day, he is associated with the Vespa. But actually, he would have preferred to be associated with helicopters. But now he has developed this legendary thing. And I think you can still see the handwriting of a helicopter designer in the Vespa to this day. Don't you think, Oli? Yes, you can see it very clearly on the front suspension, which is coming from the aircraft sector. Just like the engine, which was used back then to start the large radial engines of aircraft. For that, you first needed a starter motor. And that fitted very nicely in the back, next to the rear wheel, so that you could step through the frame. So that the ladies could also go with a skirt. And then there was something else that was very special. Dascanio was experienced with handling sheet metal and used a technique that, at that time, was used more in the automotive sector. Namely, this self-supporting sheet steel body, which makes the whole Things stiff, light and very compact. Due to the simple construction and the one-sided wheel suspension, where you could change the tire with just four screws, both front and rear were the same, was a brilliant invention. A spare tire was always included as well, because the road conditions around 46 were relatively bad. It was ideal to just pull a choke, kick the engine and immediately have a smoothly running engine. In contrast to motorcycles, where a lot of levers still had to be moved. How do I even recognize a Vespa wide frame? What are the special features that make a Vespa wide frame? First of all, in 46, the term wide frame didn't exist. There was just the Vespa. The typical features are mainly turbulent handlebars, carburetor flap in the frame, engine and engine swing arm were still separate. It was later referred to as wide frame because the frame was much wider than on the following models years later. It would be a bit beyond the scope to present all Vespa wide frame models here. So the question for you, Oli, what are the most important wide frame models that you should know when dealing with the topic? Of course, most probably know the term V98. What is V98? Actually, nothing more than that this engine had 98 cc at that time. There were four series, two in 46 and two in 47, with the same engines. Every collector wants to have a V98 in his possession. How many do you have? None. And what came after the V98? The next stage was the model from 48, which already had a fold-out side stand and the engine was expanded to 125 ccm. The engine was still a star cylinder, however, which still came from the aircraft industry. And then the model from 49 came around and I think you have that model, don't you? Yes, I actually have it. It's the oldest Vespa in my collection. However, minus late 49, early 50s, you don't know exactly. Let's check that out over there. So, this is your best, oldest piece, right? 
Right, and this is the oldest scooter in my collection. It's an N49 early 50s model. There had just this change happen, where the ribbing on the frame has disappeared, but the gears were still shifted by rods. So at some point, the change was there. The time of rod gear shift ended, and from the V30, built in 51 onwards, Vespa switched to cable operated gear shifting only. That's what we have over there, right? That's the V30. That's the V30. This one was already featuring a cable gear shift. And it still had this open side panel. What came after that? Well, intermediate stage were the models VM, VN from 53 to 56, which were similar but already only available in beige color, like this model. And from 56, 57, the lamp was placed on top of the handlebar and was then popularly called Strutzo, or stretch like. You can see that a bit here with the somewhat large headlight up here. I think it had something to do with legislation as well that the headlight was installed on top. That's right. In order to illuminate the road properly, they wanted the headlights on motorcycles to sit higher up and not down on the fenders. As soon as the lamp was raised, the engine power was also increased to 150 ccm. Makes sense, as you could see further where you were going. What's next as an interesting model? I think you have something very interesting here. A Sejourney, right? It was always my dream to own a Sejourney, actually the Vespa sports model. So I just made myself a one-to-one -one replica. It is a sports model from 53, one of the last sports models from Piaggio. The Sejourney was developed for six-day races. The special thing about it is that they experimented with a lot of components here that were then later used in the official series. And today's GS150 actually emerged from the Sejourney. Okay, so that's actually very interesting. Vespa started racing with these scooters very early on, which were actually developed for everyday use and were designed in such a way that one could get on easily and everyone could ride them. So Vespa started racing with these things very early, which I can understand very well. And from this last sports model, the last milestone in the wide frame story really emerged the Vespa GS3. And of course Oli can tell us a lot more about that model than I can. So in Italian it is actually called Grand Sport, GS150. In Germany it was called GS3, two different names. Here's the GS3, a German model, which again had to do with license production. The add-on parts were different to Italy. Bright headlights, Danford bench. In Italy, everything was equipped with a CM or Aquila bench. But the models were relatively the same. So, you can see, the thing actually looks a lot like later models that Vespa built. Up here is a cast handlebar, it's a bench, and down here you can already see the different shape of the brake drum. Die andere Form der Bremstrommel sehen, die eigentlich Nothing has changed from the external shape, based on the optics, to the PX, right? The first sport models still featured this star rim that probably everyone knows. This was then changed in the last VS5 series and they are comparable to today's PX rims. So, with that we have presented the most important models, the most important milestones, so to speak. But what makes them special are often technical details, which were actually evolutions in Vespa history, and I would like to go into that next. You may see this line going this way. This only exists on very early models and it's called a beaded frame, right Oli? This is the beaded frame, so to speak, which was actually created from 46. And that was continued to the Italian models built up to 49. Sometimes even longer for the licensed builds. In this case it is a Spanish frame. The beaded frame was actually built there until 58. And later, everything where this bead is here now was pressed out of one part. Another important feature 
we only have a spring at the front suspension. This changed from 50-51 when both dampers and springs were available in the front suspension. To make up for the fact that there is no damping here, I think there were also relatively interesting accessories with such funny leather dampers. Well, so that it wasn't just a spring working, there was a kind of friction damper. We can show it over there. We can see that one on the model from 49. Do we want to show that briefly? The friction damper actually came from the motorcycle sector. There, the spring damping was already regulated using this principle. So this piece was always accessories at Piaggio. Exactly. And you must have all seen our shock absorber video series and know by now why it is so terribly important that there is nice damping here. And here, these parts simply rotate against each other. This one is a jar here, that one is a jar there. Here you can adjust how strongly these plates are pressed against each other and there are leather washers in between. And with that, you can basically set the rebound and compression stage at the same time. The very first Vespas, like the V98, were still rigged at the back. So they sat a little lower at the back. Later, springs and dampers were added. And from 55, there was only a single spring system. A shock absorber, so to speak, which is still known today. The next major change is the gear shift. At the very beginning the gears were shifted via rods. Here you can see how it works. A rod goes up and down and a wire goes on to the rear of the gear selector box. How long was it built like that, Oli? It was built like this until the last V15 series until the end of 1950. A little longer in license production at Hoffmann, of course, until 53. But the Italians ended it with the V15 series in 1950. The new series was the V30, which already had made the change to a cable gear shift. And why was that changed? Didn't that work well? Well, over time it was clear that this rod system was relatively fragile when operated for years. The adjustment got knocked out over time. And that meant that the gears could no longer be shifted properly. That's why they switched to the more comfortable cable gear shift. On the V31 you can see that the cables go into the frame, but that the gear shifter with the cables is still outside. This changed only with the release of the VB1, one of the last wide frame models already with cast handlebars. And on the GS150 from the VS2 series, the cables disappeared in the handlebars. And here you can see what the gear cables or the operation of the gear shift looked like on the last models. In principle, just like every other Vespa that came later too. Right, Oli? That's right. The VS1, for example, already had one, but still had the cables on the outside. The Agma GL in license building still had that as well. The next very important milestone in the development of the Vespa wideframe was the change from one to two channel engine. This means the number of transfer ports, that means the route for the gasoline gas mixture from the crankcase to the cylinder. This was changed and then the engines were more powerful. Of course, that's still all on a relatively slow level, but still very interesting today, because there are significantly more tuning parts available for the two-channel motors. So, if you want to be a little faster on the road today, then it is more worthwhile to use such a two-channel motor. And when exactly this change was, and how you can tell, that is what Ole will tell us. The last single-channel engine was built on the V33 in late 52. Then there was the change to a two-channel engine. And we also know, in late 52 was also the end of the color green. The side panel was closed and they changed the colors to a gray beige and installed a two-channel motor there. That is also quite interesting. In the past, Vespas were really only made in one color. So there was no color catalog like there is now. There was only green. Well, the first V9080s still had a silver tone. From 48 it went over to this green tone that we know. And every licensee had its own green mix. For example, Hoffmann, fish silver green. Agmas also had a different shade of green. 
ACMA ended the production of green scooters from 53. At Hoffmann, the green lasted until 54, and then other colors were painted in general. But there is also a nice visual identifier. Here, the side panel with the slits, and before that, the completely open side panel. It should also be mentioned that the Italians always had the changes first. The licensees usually produced it a little longer. So Hoffmann has been producing the open side panel for much longer as has Agma, and for the longest actually Moto Vespa from Spain. So, the hot shit was first done by the parent plant in Pontedera, and these great technical innovations like the side panel has now slits instead of an opening, with that the others just had to wait. Let's get to the next milestone. We have already mentioned that at some point the lamp was moved from the fender to the handlebar. But, if I understood correctly, the material of the attachments, namely the fenders and the side panels, have also changed. What about that, Oli? What has changed there? In the beginning, the side panels and fenders were pressed from aluminium. Later, they switched to steel. The lamp disappeared from bottom to the top from around 55 with the VL series. That was the first model that had a lamp at the handlebar. Nice. And this is an ACMA. I think it always has the lamp at the top, right? Well, at the license manufacturer ACMA, the traffic regulations were inherent in that the lamp always had to be at the handlebar. It should also be mentioned, with Douglas, the lamp was in the middle. Each country had its own regulations. Okay. Can I somehow visually tell whether I have an aluminum fender or a steel fender? Well, not visually at first glance, by knocking and preferable holding a magnet to it. Another important feature by which you can recognize the different generations of wide frame frames is the tank size. They got bigger and bigger. That's right. It started with such a square tank, which had a tank volume of around 4.5 to 5 liters. In the later models, such as the VM or VL series, the tanks were getting a little larger. Here the tank went more into the top of the frame. And the largest tank actually had the GS150, where the entire volume of the frame was used. The last important technical innovation that we would like to point out to you is the switch from the small 8-inch wheels to 10-inch wheels, as you can see on the GS3. Why did they do that, Oli? In order to simply get smoother running on long-distance journeys, they switched to 10-inch wheels eventually. With the wide frame, that was only the case with the GS150, however. The Akma GL had 9 inches. Now let's get to our last chapter, the bonus section, so to say. Is there anything else that is interesting to know about this first generation of Vespa scooters? Are there any special models, any special stories that you can tell us, Oli? Well, these sports models were fitted with both 8-inch and 10-inch tires. The idea behind it was to drive with 10 inches on long distances and convert to 8 inches for the mountain routes. And if you look at old pictures, you can often see that the drivers had a spark plug socket stuck in their boot so that they could change tires quickly. Another interesting thing that you can see here, if you look at these special rims, they look a bit different from other Vespa scooters, and that's because you could screw two different sizes onto the same brake drum. Right. These sports models were equipped so that this brake drum, which was designed for 10 inches, could also be driven with 8 inch rims. That's why the rim looks different from the series. Okay. And with these racing models, you simply gained a lot of experience and actually implemented it, right? Yes, the innovation was to implement the experience gained in the races into the standard models. The next specialty that might be worth mentioning is the Vespa U, an economy model where they have saved so much that there is not much left of the design either. And I think it didn't sell that well. Well, Piaggio also got competition from other brands, and they just wanted to bring a cheap model onto the market that was completely slimmed down. 
Unfortunately, it wasn't a successful model, more like a flop. From today's perspective, of course, a rare collector's item. Sure, if something like this is rare, it will of course be expensive. I think a Vespa U is one of the most expensive Vespas you can buy today. She's still ugly. But there are also things like the V98, and I can imagine that a lot of people are now interested in it. It's rare, it's the first Vespa. Can I buy it and how much would it cost me if I could still get it today somehow? The range is relatively wide because there's a first to fourth series. But if you want to buy one today and want it to be more or less original, then you have to put between 50,000 and 70,000 euros on the table. That's lots. Probably not the entry-level model or affordable for every beginner. But would you say that, if we have excited a few people for the early Vespas with this video, that there is somehow a model that is suited best as an entry into the Vespa wideframe world? I would make sure that the right frame definitely has a two-channel motor, regardless of which license manufacturer. And I would say that the Akma is still the most affordable at the moment. It allows for even more fun later if you want to switch to tuning at some point. All right. With that, we're actually already finished with today's video. Big applause for Oli, who really brought in an expertise that is usually missed in my videos. Thanks a lot for this. If you liked this video, please leave us a like. And if you want to see the next episode about the Vespa large frame, then don't forget to subscribe and press the bell. If you liked it or if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments. See you next time!